Welcome back to the show, everybody. We got a great one lined up for you today. If I can actually do the intro without stumbling over two syllable words. So (laughs) this is the third time. Hopefully I'll nail it this time. Flare Networks News has exchanged participation. You're going to want to know about it. China's digital yuan adoption just got a lot bigger. Banks and crypto. And this time we're going to Singapore to talk about it. And how does Gary Gensler really feel? ETH is a security or not? Well, I think you're going to be very surprised at the clip we're about to play for you today. $610 million in a DeFi hack, but we'll get into it. There's a slight little detail you're going to want to know. SEC versus Ripple update timeline, thanks to Hall of Famer XRP Crypto Wolf and Michael Val Five Links. Breton Five uh, Breton Woods anniversary. Look, I almost messed it up again. Let Let's do this while we're at it. Let's roll that beautiful intro before I say something else messed up. This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at BackupBradleyAbove and everything that we're talking about here today. Thank God it's Friday. I almost messed that intro up for the third time. That's amazing. But we made it. We're in here. For those of you who don't know, why is that so special? Because when I hit record on these videos, there is no editing that is done. I, I record, I lay everything out, I storyboard the news on my legal pads every morning, line the tabs up, I do the thing, one shot, you get it or you start over, and hopefully we don't have to do that for a third or fourth time today. So, welcome back everybody, it's 1.939 trillion for the cryptocurrency market cap, a lot of money in the space, we were at 1.95 though, so about 20 billion, maybe uh 15, 10 billion missing from the market, sold out of the market at the moment. But that doesn't mean that we're not going where all the technical analysts have told us we're going. And I really do believe we are going to those special places. And I'm talking about new all time highs for XRP. And in the short term, you know, dollar 20 plus, 250, all these price targets that we've heard that we've talked about from technical analysts so, so many times. It's because they're not off the table. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's high. That's clickbait. Oh, yeah. Well, the stuff happens to be coming true because I remember people telling me hundreds and hundreds of times, either on Twitter or on uh, YouTube comments, XRP would never be a dollar. Problem is, it's a dollar right now. So it's a dollar two, and we're looking at uh, even higher gains overnight. And we'll see if we get our footing in a breath after a bit of a sell off. You could see that at this price point. People taking a little profits, and the next thing you know, we'll see if we got the uh, muster to make it back up that hill and push for a dollar 20. Right now, we're ranging on the low end at 92 cents, and at the upper end, we're at a dollar five. So that whole XRP not going to be a dollar no more? That's out the window for all the haters. Yeah, this is really something that I've always been excited about. And I tell you guys about it all the time. Crypto taxation in America is a mess. I trust capital is the solution. If you wanted to know what's better than crypto, tax free crypto for goodness sakes. Make sure you check them out. Link in the description, link in the comment box. Uh, By the way, nothing feels better than filling out the paperwork and signing your documents so you can go ahead and fund your IRA for the year. That is something me and Mrs. Backup are extremely excited about, and we're in the process of finishing that right now. Very, very excited. All right, looking here, some more exciting news. Flare Community is announcing here that for those who are holding XRP on Binance U.S., the recent exchange that Brian Brooks was the CEO and now resigned from, if you held the minimum amount of XRP tokens with them at that time of the snapshot, I think it was December 12, 2020, you will see your Flare tokens in your wallet once the airdrop occurs and the network is stable. So there is one exchange coming into the game right there. Okay, now, This is Hall of Famer Michael, and he tells us that that $610 million attack on DeFi was actually like a white hat behavior. So basically, the hackers went in and took the money, but are giving it back, right? They're returning almost all of the stolen funds amid the project, uh, saying their actions constituted white hat behavior. In other words, a hacker physically taking the time to say, hey, Your platform is vulnerable, and if you don't believe me, 
I'm just going to go ahead and show you and remove 610 million from it. But don't worry, I'm going to give most of it back. There you go. Uh, you know, this is why I've said I don't want the first cell phone. I didn't want the first iPad. I didn't want the first computer, right? So on, the first page, so on, so on, and so on. First generation tech. It, it shows the it shows all of us what's possible, but it's never the end solution, right? So it's just something to think about even in crypto, right? Bitcoin being the first tech. Looking right here, XRP Crypto Wolf, 300 million crypto users as of 2021. That, that is only 4% of the world's population utilizes the power of cryptocurrency. And what do you think about that number? 4% of the population. I mean, that that is nothing when it comes to adoption. Imagine what this market looks like at 10, 20, 30, 40% adoption, let alone bigger than that. I mean, it's just, it, to me, the upside here, this is how early we are. That's one of the things it reminds me of. And here is another signal that while there's all this malaise and confusion with government and legislation and market regulators here in the United States, here's somebody that's not confused. It's Singapore. DBS Bank has a brokerage arm and its digital exchange, DDX, gets approval from the Monetary Authority in Singapore to offer crypto services to asset managers and companies you know that's why i love that this is a global effort and this technology is global now, you may do whatever you want here in the u.s but it's only going to harm the country that puts the constraints that stifles innovation it's like cutting your nose off spite your face right yeah it's not going to work and i think that the u.s will get it figured out I, I think with people like tom emmer and others in the house of representatives as we saw in the senate there's enough mustard there's enough moxie there and now that the government is clearly considering the uh, collection of revenue from cryptocurrency as a part of their infrastructure bills is two things it's legitimate to them because they're going to get 28 billion in reported tax revenue off of it so that's huge for them and that means crypto's here to stay the other legitimate aspect of that is is the reason they tuck cryptocurrency in the infrastructure bill is because certain digital assets in their payment protocols will become i believe a part of the u.s infrastructure i do believe xrp to believe one of them be one of those as well as well as stellar not financial advice bond crypt xrp is a hall of famer and he says way to go china Literally wanting innovation and to lead the fourth industrial revolution, not like other countries where greed, power, and independent personal wealth gains at the expense of the less fortunate dominates the narrative. If I wasn't, you know, sure, I'd say he was talking about the United States and the crap we've seen with Jay Clayton and William Hinman and now the plausible deniability of Gary Gensler at the helm at the SEC. China's digital yuan pushes on, and now they're really introducing the digital yuan into their 428 stations across 24 lines of their subway system. This goes to show just how far ahead they are at implementing their digital dollar in China. More pressure from around the world while we see that kind of confusion and bad acting going on uh, with the market regulator uh, industry here with the case against Ripple and SEC. John Deaton says here, Gary Gensler, how many petitions does the SEC receive in a year that has 30,000 or more signatures on it? These 30,000 signatures are of the very people you are sworn to protect. Don't they deserve a response? Man, John Deaton is amazing. Why has John Deaton never been on this show with me? We got to make, we got to change that. We got to fix that, John. Crypto and policy petition update our petition to Gary Gensler with 30,000 signatures demanding a regulatory framework for crypto and an ethics investigation into Jay Clayton and William Hinman has been referred to. Get this, the SEC.gov Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. You know, this is like stonewalling by the SEC because they just don't care. They don't care about us. They use those words to say it, but their actions absolutely define something else, does it not? In fact, it's the SEC that's protecting William Hinman, who's actually not at the SEC anymore, and they're coming to his protection throughout the, this case as if he's still at the SEC. Why did the SEC take someone's personal opinion like William Hinman to, get, to begin with and then apply it to application of the SEC broadly? 
you know, let alone the point that John Deaton's making here. I signed that damn petition, and Gary Gensler's done nothing. And I tell you, so far, Gary, it's been unimpressive, brother. And it gets even more unimpressive when we look at this here from Shehab, who gives us this tweet where Gary Gensler's at MIT and tells us at his time at MIT it, the exact words, the exact words he believes ETH is a security. Listen to this. This four-part test, in my mind, suggests that most, maybe not all, but most initial coin offerings are securities. Keep listening. Because they're investment contracts where there is an exchange of money, there's a common enterprise, you're relying on somebody else's expertise for profits. And this is why I've earlier this year said, I think that most of them are. I think Ether, when it was done in 2014, would pass this test. When I say pass, it means it's a security. There you go. And he says it right there. He recognizes that it's a security. Now, what I'm asking everyone here to do is to politely, and I mean politely, retweet and tag Gary Gensler in this tweet from Twitter right here every single day, every time it crosses your mind until he gets to, he gets what he needs to answer the damn question. That's what we got to have. And let's not drop this ball. We got the 30 plus thousand signatures that he's ignored. Well, let's see if he can ignore all of us on Twitter. Because I tell you what, as an investor in this space, I'm tired of being ignored and not protected. And in fact, harmed by the SEC, not by my investments, but by the SEC. Uh, you know, as we look at this, let's look at the timeline for this case while we're here. By the way, don't forget that through all of this, that is very frustrating at times. XRP, when it comes out the other side of this case, and we're about to look at the timeline, will be the most compliant, the most vetted digital asset on planet Earth. And as I've been asking on this channel, I ask it again, because my philosophy is to stack my pennies next to their dollars. Who are there? The big institutional players of the world who have built out this space. And... Venture capitalists even, right? Where are they going to put their money once that moment is realized? Where do you think they're going to put the money? I don't think it's a real big leap. Looking right here from XRP Crypto Wolf here. The timeline for us here is August 16th, Ripple response to SEC's emergency motion for discovery conference regarding the Slack communications. August 17th, we see SEC's response to Ripple's motion for discovery conference regarding the SEC's improper assertion of the deliberative process privilege and any motion to seal exhibits filed with that motion. August 31st, fact discovery deadline. October 15th, expert discovery deadline. We are waiting for decisions regarding the following, whether the court will hold a telephone conference to discuss the discovery disputes regarding the deliberative process privilege and the Slack communications. We're also waiting for the motion to intervene from John Deaton, which he has not heard anything as far as that I'm aware of. The SEC's motion to strike Ripple's lack of due process and fair notice affirmative defense. The uh, individual's defendant's motion to dismiss the SEC's first amended complaint. And no argument dates have been set regarding the motion to intervene or the motion to dismiss or the motion to strike. Uh, I, you know, I almost wonder if it'll ever get dealt with, to be honest with you. I mean, but one thing I do know is what I said, is that when this case is over, and believe me, this case will end, and I believe if I understand it correctly, we've got to get through all of these deadlines in order to reach a place where the judge can come to a summary judgment. But I believe it's about letting all of these deadlines happen. And that could take us, you know, into the first of the year as I understand the process. So, okay. So from that, imagine what happens after that. And that's, that's amazing. Now, while all of this is happening, while we're catching up with what's going on with Ripple and XRP and understanding to have widespread adoption around the world, knowing that we've had money printing at his, historical, never before seen levels, we're reaching a moment where monetary cycles die and need to be started again or changed or rebooted in some sort. 
And isn't it surreal that after 50 years after Bretton Woods' agreement effectively ended with the Nixon shock, that he's standing, Jeff Booth is standing in the Grand Hotel today talking about a new open decentralized monetary system that allows a peaceful transition to future. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about Block, block Works, Bretton Woods, the realignment. And this is really a conversation, and it's really not so much central bankers and the like. The profile is a lot of uh, people that cover the space, and there are some heavyweights here, but they're really discussing what is going to happen. How does this trans transition take place, right? So, uh, and I'm looking here. I did have earlier, and I can't see it. Well, maybe if this has the profiles, I'm not sure. Yes, it does. So it doesn't, well, it might be, I can't remember, but I can't remember if this is the list of everybody who's there or not, but nevertheless, this is the conference that's happening between the 11th and 13th, and it is happening on the heels of the anniversary of the, uh, Bretton Woods moment that we had. Now we know that the, um, IMF director Kristalina Georgieva is calling for a new Bretton Woods moment. And this is Daniela Cambone from uh, Stansberry Research. And she has Jim Rickards on her channel. And shout out to both of them. This is a great conversation that starts off about the gold standard and how it was not the problem the way it was ditched originally back in what the 60s, early 70s uh, with Nixon and coming off the gold standard. Listen to this opener here because. I think this is important that we understand crypto wise, we're moving to a new world. We're trying, they're trying to move us all from a debt based system to a multipolar, multi asset system and an asset back system, right? So let's hear what happens here. And he does get the question put to him by Daniela about the idea of crypto playing a role in this with gold. So let's hear, start right here. The criticism is, you know, the great thing about the Fed is they can do that. They can expand the money supply and contract the money supply as needed to keep inflation under control and to grow with the economy. Well, you can have that with a gold standard. In fact, we did from 1913 to 1971 in various ways. Uh, we had a gold standard, but we also had discretionary monetary policy. The Fed was expanding and contracting the money supply from 1913 to 1971. And we had a gold standard, so they're not incompatible at all. Uh, but it, but it does mean that you can't go you can't go too far. Uh, so it kind of puts a lid on things. Until 19, um, 1945, uh, the law in the United States was the the base money supply M zero. That's what the Fed controls. Could be two and a half times the U.S. gold uh, hoard, the gold uh, in our possession. At the market. So taking originally $20.67 an ounce, later $35 an ounce, take the amount of gold times $35 an ounce, and whatever that number was, multiply by two and a half, and that's how big the money supply could be. But uh, so you can't go beyond that. But I, I actually talked to Ben Bernanke about this because I was, you hear over and over, you know, the gold caused the Great Depression. Gold was the problem in the Great Depression. And I researched it, and actually the leading scholar after Milton Friedman was Ben Bernanke. And he showed with you know very uh, precise detail that the money supply during the Great Depression never exceeded 100% of the gold. Uh, in other words, the money supply could have been two and a half times greater than it was in the Great Depression with a gold standard. So gold was never a constraint. The Fed screwed it up. The Fed messed it up badly, but it had nothing to do with gold because they were nowhere near the ceiling. And when I, when I talked to Bernanke, I said, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I said, this is my understanding of your research. Do I have it right? Do I have a correct understanding? He said, yes, you do. So, so gold was never a problem in the Great Depression. So you can have both. You can have a gold standard and discretionary monetary policy. You just can't get crazy. Really great, really great analysis there from Jim. As always, he's amazing. But it's interesting to find out that even Ben Bernanke confirmed for him that, you know, uh, the gold standard wasn't the problem. I was always taught that that was the problem. And now we find out that it really wasn't. Okay, now let's move here because, first of all, this entire conversation is amazing. But I want to move here because he talks about what's to come here. And he's asked, what would a new Bretton Woods look like? For this. And this is important because they just had the realignment conference, which is finishing today, right? What would a new Bretton Woods system look like for you? Is it tied to 
or is it involving digital currencies then, Jim? What do you think? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion about digital currencies and people think of Bitcoin and, and all that. But the central banks are moving towards central bank digital currencies, which are not cryptocurrencies. They're, they, the message traffic can be encrypted, but, you know, digital dollar is still a dollar. A digital euro is still a euro and a digital yen is still a yen and so forth. The central banks would still, you know, have discretionary authority over monetary policy. It's just that you probably wouldn't have any paper money. Um, and payments in a digital dollar, for example, could be faster and cheaper than what we have today. You know, we all use credit cards. That's an electronic payment. But there's a merchant acquirer fee of two and a half percent on, uh, you know, when you charge something, the merchant gets two and a half percent less than what you pay because they have to pay that amount to a processor to get their money. Now, that point alone shows you how a neutral bridge asset and a decentralized exchange like the XRP ledger could eliminate that. We all know that it's like 200 thousandths of a penny to do a transaction or something like that on the XRP ledger. It's very, very inexpensive. So that point alone shows how crypto and blockchains, payment networks like XRP and the XRP ledger could certainly serve to really not only uh, save a lot of money on fees like that, but they could also really help to aid the formula for the velocity of money of getting this economy jump started again. All right, now let me move quickly because, like I said, this whole thing is a, is a great conversation, but that's where we were there. So let me move to this right here. You're going to want this. What would a gold standard uh, eliminate as a problem? And listen to what he says about how much gold should be to help eliminate the problems we have today. Just for a second here, Jim, uh, let's pretend we were on a gold standard today. Right. What greatest problem would it eliminate? Well, it depends how you do it. And this is the problem with gold standards. Gold standards have failed in the past, as we know. Uh, and governments always make the same mistake. And it's a mistake you have to avoid, which is they get the price wrong. When you go on a gold standard, you're fixing a parity between, say, dollars and weight of gold. You're, you're, you're measuring weight of gold in dollars. So it's, it's no different than any other cross rate. If you have the euro US dollar cross rate or the dollar yen cross rate, well, this is just going to be a dollar gold cross rate with the gold measured by weight. But you got to get the price right. So uh, could you do it at $1,800 an ounce, which is about the current price? Well, legally you could, but that would be a fiasco because it's highly deflationary. In other words, um, you people say you can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold to support commerce and leverage and uh, industrial and commercial loans and the whole financial system. There's not enough gold. That's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, could you do it at $1,800 an ounce? No. But could you do it at $15,000 an ounce? Yes. So if you said, okay, you know, Jim, you're, you're in charge of going back to the new gold standard. Let's uh, have be a convening power and get the G7 and the G20 finance ministers together and have a new Bretton Woods type conference. Maybe we, I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire. Maybe we could do it up at Bretton Woods, which is just a little <laughs> bit up the road than that Washington hotel. But the point is, uh, the big, there are a lot of technical issues, but the biggest single issue they would face is getting the price right. And I've calculated it several different ways. And the, the low end is $15,000 an ounce. That's one of the reasons I make that. And there you have it. And it's interesting because you know that there's a lot of people out here that believe that XRP at some point will be backed by gold. I'm not necessarily one of them. I think that the collateralization on the ledger that could you know, speak to helping provide a floor price or a, or a price set that you've heard me and other people talk about could be cash reserves backing central bank digital system or digital currencies for the central banking system. And I think providing those reserves held on the ledger could, in fact, or representing the uh, CBDCs that are on the ledger, could provide a floor value for all of the value uh, that's moving across the ledger. It wouldn't be just fiat. It wouldn't be just gold. It would be all their a portion thereof, right? So that's personally my take on it. But there are people out here that do believe that XRP would be backed solely by gold and, and work in effect that way. I'm not particularly one of them. I think it would be uh, collateralize the ledger with many, many different assets as possible of value. So, all right, now one more shot here of this, and then we're going to wrap this up. And I want to give this to you. And this is interesting because at the end, they talk about 
here and they talk about the 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 anniversary of Bretton Woods and where we are now and we all know we're in a horrible situation now and basically what would uh what does it look like when when we move to these changes is it going to be a sweeping effect uh with like crypto and crypto or are we going to see a piecemeal rollout and i believe that i've got this far enough back to catch where it jumps into that let's check the point is August 15th, 1971, a very big deal. But the lesson is that happened in stages over about 40 years. So that's how the elites operate, just a slice, a slice, a slice, a slice. People are asleep, they're complacent, and then it's all gone before they know it. Piecemeal. Yeah. Piecemeal, she says. Exactly. That's exactly. Fascinating. Fascinating insights, Jim. Listen. Uh, makes me think of the regulation that's coming on board for crypto, that it might yeah. have one sweeping change, right? But you'll Correct. see it. It's, it, it's, like there's people. a name for it. You're right. It's called piecemeal social engineering. It's proposed by Karl Popper. And the biggest advocate today is George Soros. Enough said. <laughs> there you have it. What a great conversation. Shout out to the both of them for it. <clears throat> piecemeal, right? to roll these things out. And isn't that what we've been talking about is legislation doesn't need to be everything we need. We're talking about the development of technology and innovation driving, being the driving force. So you really want legislation to have a light touch like the early days of the internet so you don't stifle things. And that way you can have just enough of a a framework that everybody can work inside of, but bad actors are bad actors and they're going to be caught and run down. Right. <clears throat> but the real, the real deal for me here is, is I see this exactly happening like that in a piecemeal fashion, whether it becomes the token taxonomy act or the securities clarity act <clears throat> combination with the U S infrastructure bill and the crypto uh, amendment and portion of that bill. I think these these pieces of legislation will start to roll out and that will help us to kick the log jam open for investing, growing, building out the space, everything about it, building practical applications so we can start to integrate it with the legacy uh, traditional structures of the world. I mean, that's where this is really going. And I do see a piecemeal situation rolling out and not just one bill and everybody go back to work and then there's nothing else. Because it, you're not going to know, there's no way to know what technology survives and which ones don't until you give them that really that framework or a loose regulatory sandbox, what have you, to be able to truly run and try to have the technology prove itself out. That's what we're talking about here. All right, before we get out of here, I do want to acknowledge that price has been moving here with XRP. Sitting at a dollar or just slightly above, we are being reminded by Coins Kid here that we can always roll over in price and we could always roll back to 85 cents. And if not there, the 70 cent range, right? And beyond if it breaks hard going the wrong way for us. But if we continue to push up and we get past that dollar uh, nine mark and get into that, range and above we could be staring down a dollar 21 and beyond that's going to do it for me make sure you hit the like and subscribe before i get out of here hey 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 it's back but not for long so you hurry link to's got uphold back on the board baby make sure you check out all the comments and, or comment box and description and all the links in them they are products and services i use each and every day trusted vetted links i will catch all of you on the next one